Hello, and welcome once again to Family Historian. Tonight we are going to learn about the final record in all of our lives, death and burial records. And on that morbid note, I would like to have you meet my guest. His name is Brian Schnell. Brian has been here before because he is so darn smart. Brian is the assistant director of the Jefferson Historical Society and Museum in Jefferson, New Jersey. And on tonight's show, his young man, this very fine young man, is going to assist me in explaining how we can use death and burial records in finding our ancestors. And now let's welcome Brian Schnell. Brian, welcome back. Thank you for having me again, Stephen. It's wonderful to be back. We look like a pair of undertakers tonight. We definitely do. For our death and burial record show. I want to thank you and your society and museum for giving me the inspiration for tonight's show. I know you do many exhibits there, and you had one there a few months ago that was very interesting to me. Can you tell our viewers the title of that exhibit? Sure. Our exhibit was of Mad Men, Moors and Mourning, and it was our, our venture into Victorian mourning customs and culture surrounding that, where we were, we were showcasing different mourning pieces, clothing, records, all things of that nature. Mm -hmm. And the Victorians had a kind of fascination with death. It was really a morbid fascination. And uh, they would attend seances to, uh, to contact the departed, and they would have all kinds of decorations for them. Is that correct? That is correct. The, se the seances were to contact the spirits of deceased relatives who they were not able to get closure with. And the different art pieces were, was known as mourning jewelry, mm -hmm. where they would take, for example, a lock of hair and twist it into a brooch or even appliques on a skirt. I know you saw the one that we had on display where yes. it was on the skirt. Yeah, very interesting. <clears throat> But we as genealogists, we, are, we, we face reality. And I always said to my viewers that when you are a genealogist, I think you're more in touch with the realities of life and death is part of life. <coughs> and as a genealogist, I see the record. You know, we see the action, this, this event did occur. This person did pass away. Now we're going to teach you, uh, Brian and I, about the various sources that you can use. Now, never leave any stone unturned. Is that correct? That is correct. So if one source doesn't have it, go to another source that will have it. Uh, records have different kinds of information. Let's start with the government or vital records. You've all heard of the Bureau of Vital Statistics. Every state has one. In New Jersey, we have the State Archives in Trenton, and we're very lucky here in New Jersey because, Brian, how far back do our vital records go in New Jersey? In New Jersey, our records go back as far as with the first week of May of 1848. Very good. The first week of May, 1848. Yes, that so is that, correct. That gives you a lot of leeway right there. That is like 200 years of information. Right, very good. Now, I'd like to show you uh, a copy of a death record uh, from the year 1885. This was a project I was working on many years ago. It's the death record of Joseph Pierce, who died on 6 February 1885. And the record is abounding with information. You will get the name of the deceased, the person's age at the time of their death, the place of death, the person's profession, in this case he was a farmer, his place of birth, his parentage, which will give you another generation to work with, uh, his cause of death, and this is very interesting, he died of some kind of vascular infection. And uh, it will give you the undertaker's name, and the place of burial. So there is a lot of information on the death record. Uh, we have another one. These are all government records now, and I'm using the word record, and I'll tell you why. 
Uh, we have another one from the year 1880 right here in New Jersey. And here is one from Missouri, a newer one from the year 1933. Now let's go way back in time. Uh, this is very personal to me. I did lots of research on my ancestors in uh, Italy. Um, and this is the actual death record of my great, 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 great grandfather. His name was Stefano. That's why I'm named Stephen. My family had a bug for that name, okay? And he died on 31 August 1812. And it lists a lot of information. Uh, he died in his own house and it lists his parentage. So now I have the names of my five greats uh, uh, grandparents. So this is a wealth of information on the death record and these are government records. Now, there's also something called a death certificate. Now, this is where we have to find the difference between those. This is genealogy terminology. Brian, what is the difference between a record and a certificate? Let's clear this up for our viewers. Of course. There is a distinct difference. The record has all of the primary information. It's the primary source mm -hmm. where it's going to list the cause, the location, the undertaker, all of that. Right. However, the certificate, it just, it's the additional information that prove, that you put together to prove the person has passed on or been born or whatever it's certifying. Right. It's a very, it's sometimes it's very ornate. Yes. And we yes. have a copy of a certificate. I remember <clears throat> years ago, Brian, when I went for my driver's license, they mm -hmm. said to me, which was wrong, they said, bring your birth certificate. What they really should have said was bring your birth record, you see. So I went home and I brought a, a certificate that was given to the hospital with my name on it, okay? And they sent me back. They said, this is not a government issue. This is not a legitimate record, you see. So I had to go back and get my birth record with the seal on the back. And then I could take my, my driver test. So that is the distinction between the record and the certificate. So we'll be using the word record a lot tonight. The record once more is the... It is the primary source document that has all the information. Right. Whereas the certificate is the secondary and it's more of the ornate... Right. You know, confirmation of the fact. Right. So the record will authenticate the certificate. Yes. And when I do research for clients, I like to give them the original record. It's almost as if you're citing your sources for the certificate. Perfect, <clears throat> perfect. Okay, now the next source we have are church records, and we all use church records. Uh, even if we don't go to church, we wind up going to a church. And you can find these in about three different areas. You can find them in the church archives. You can find them generally in a centralized location. Right. For example, if the parish is part of a larger congregation, mm -hmm. you can find them in bound volumes in print. Right. So in other words, and you can find them in the church itself. Yes. I know yes. Uh, I've done many uh, church record research shows here and the churches will still have the original records there and every church will have an archive. Yes. Like the Presbyterians have one in uh, Philadelphia and many of the churches have sent their records there. So that's where you can find baptism, marriage, and death records. Uh, so we have those three. And we do have um, a printed source. Many of these church records have been printed and we have one here from the Hamilton County, Ohio uh, church records. Yes. And these are from 1811 to 1849. It's a very early volume of it, but there are volumes that go further back that are printed. So a lot of churches will put their records in a printed source yes, or a will. local historian will do it or a genealogist. Okay, now, uh, we're going to get to the cemetery records, which is a very good source. And there are many locations for these. 
you start with the cemetery itself. Typically they are, they can be housed in the cemetery's offices, right within their files. Mm -hmm. Alternatively, you could also find it on findagrave.com. Right. It's okay. basically an, inter an internet digitized version of that, of the cemetery's records. Generally that will list the person's name, mm -hmm. age, birth and death, sometimes an obituary, sometimes a photo of the tombstone, but it will also list the cemetery name. And this is in findagrave. Yes, findagrave.com. Right, but in the records, I understand you can also find who was the buyer of the plot. Yes, you can. You can find the plot number, the buyer of the plot. You can sometimes even find their neighbors who, right. who is buried in adjoining plots. Right, and we do have a copy to show you of the Woodlands Cemetery. It's kind of difficult to read, but who said genealogy was easy, okay? You really have to buckle down and learn it. Stephen, it's fun, not easy. Right, that's it, okay. Um, and then you have printed cemetery records. I know at one time I was a trustee of the Genealogical Society of New Jersey, okay, very official. And I would go on these cemetery forays and we would go into the cemetery and copy the stones and then publish them. I would do one row, another person would do another row. We would have a pumice rock if we could not read the, the stone. So that's another source. And then there are cemeteries that do publish uh, their records. And we have one here of the Back Creek. The Back Creek Friends Society. It was one of those odd fellow groups. Right, or at Quakers, I think. Yes, the yes. Quakers, yeah. So many of them will be there. And of course, findagrave.com. But you told me that you have to be careful. You with do find. have to be very careful. Tell us, tell us why. You have to be careful with findagrave.com because it can be edited by anybody. They can change dates, information, pictures. It's as bad as Wikipedia used to be. Right, but you do, you have found success yes. with it. We have found success within the Historic Society. We were able to actually recently put a name to a tombstone that had been worn mm -hmm. in an old cemetery not too far from our museum. Right, very good. <clears throat> now, our next source that we use, as I said, do not leave any stone unturned. What one source has, the other or doesn't have, the other one might. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? That is. And you've experienced this yourself yes. in your research. Now, let's talk about newspapers, and we're going to show you some old newspapers. Um, of course, the obits. Can you explain that yes, for the, us? So the obituaries, that is ba essentially where they're going to post when the person dies. Mm -hmm. Basically, so-and-so has passed. They were, this is where they were born, mm -hmm. so, some of the family members. And occasionally, and it's more common as you get more modern with the obituaries right. in the newspapers, Funeral arrangements. Yes. Like yes. when you can come visit. And I've seen even in lieu of flowers, please donate to whatever charitable cause. Right. So you'll get the name of the deceased, of course. It'll say yes. died in the, in the newspaper. But then you get all the relatives and people who are attending. I know I just found an obituary of my great-grand-uncle. He was my great-grandfather's brother and he was a farmer up in Fredonia, New York, which is near Buffalo. And they mentioned um, all of the people who attended, his, his children, his, his grandkids, and then people who came from out of town. Yes. They ne mentioned, and of course, uh, the name of the uh, priest who officiated at the funeral, but they did not mention where he was buried, though. No. That would most likely have come from the guest book that mm -hmm. was at the entrance to the funeral services. People would sign that. It would list their name. Right. A contact, a form of contact. Right, right. And even sometimes a relationship to the person. So what one source did not have, the other source would have. Mm -hmm. okay. You can get a complete picture by piecing together all the different sources. Right. And there is uh, another site that you can go to for newspapers, and what is that called? Very simply, it's called newspapers.com, and they host digitized versions of thousands, if not tens of thousands, 
of newspapers from across the United States, from across p different periods of history. And of course, obituaries yes. are contained in there. Have yes. you used that source? I have. When we were doing our Gothic literature exhibit, mm -hmm. I used it to locate the scandalous obituary of Edgar Allan Poe. And what did that say? What did that have It to was say? actually written by some, an opponent of his who was on the same newspaper as mm -hmm, him. Mm -hmm. And it was scandalous because it was all a lot of negativity surrounding him and about how horrible of a person he was. Right. Instead of any actual, well, instead of too much relevant information. Isn't that something? And this was in the newspaper. It was. And it was allowed to be published. It was. I wonder what Al Edgar Allan Poe, well, I guess, was he deceased at the time? Or? He was, he was, I by see. approximately three days. Right. Now, let's go, although I don't want to go, let's go to a funeral home, because funeral homes did keep records. They kept very good records. And um, <clears throat> the newer funeral homes, well, how long have the funeral, the funeral parlor, how, I know undertakers have been here since the Egyptian times when they would mummify the, the mummies, okay, embalm the mummies. But the, the, uh, f how long has the funeral home been around in our country? In its current form within our country, the funeral home has been around since the, roughly the end of World War II. Right. And realistically, that started more on the, on the West Coast. Right, Especially right. after Pearl Harbor right. because of the massive amounts of casualties. Yes. It was very difficult to host thousands of funerals at one time. Now, prior to the invention of the funeral home, people would have the body in their own? Would yes, lay out it the... was considered, it was called a home funeral. Mm -hmm. And the deceased would be bathed, prepared, and clothed. The undertaker would come to the house and do all Sometimes, yes. sometimes the undertaker would do it. Other times, the women in the family would take care of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they would bathe them, clothe them and prepare them with flowers and lay them out right in what would later become known as the living room. Right, the living room. That's where we get that's the That's where it comes from. Right, right, right. And I, I know that certain relatives of mine who passed on in the 1920s and 30s uh, before <clears throat> World War II were laid out in the home. And you can still do it, you know. Yes, you Nowadays, can. You, I mean, and you, you, do just have, you do have to ask for it and specifically request it. And it's cheaper. Because it you're, is. Not, you're not renting the room at the funeral parlor. And in some cases, the setup tends to be much nicer because it's more customized to what the person would have wanted. Right. Now, I've been in some old houses, and in the living room, you'll see like a, a, an indentation in the wall. Yes, an alcove of sorts. An alcove, that's the word. Yes. And that's where they would place the casket. Yes, they would place it either in the alcove or just in front of the alcove, and they would, they would sometimes use the alcove to hold religious iconography, additional flowers, right, right. or photos. Yeah, but now most people go to the funeral parlor. Yes, right. they go to the funeral home because it's much easier because they take care of everything. Yes, It's yes. a one-stop shop. Right, right. Well, I, <laughs> I guess... <laughs> Awful way to put it, but... Like I said, death is part of life, and... Uh, Death and burial records are uh, part of part of life, part of genealogy, yeah. um, and and bombing that did not come up. W when did that come into being? That came into being roughly around the Civil War period, toward the end of it. Mm -hmm. You some people argue that it came about roughly in Gettysburg, right? But it wasn't as common. You saw it more toward the end of the Civil War, right? Right. And that was to in order to preserve the bodies of the deceased soldiers to have them returned home to their families for proper burials. And tell us about Abe Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln was actually our first president to be embalmed. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to make sure that he was handled so well because of his status and his importance to the country that right. they spared no expense. He was prepared so well that they were able to take him on, if I remember correctly, a 100-stop funeral train tour mm -hmm, mm -hmm. on his way back to Springfield for his yeah. burial. But years and years ago, the, uh, the, the Egyptians were preserving. They were. But I guess that was lost, that secret. They had a secret way of doing it. They had their way of doing it, and, peop and so Egyptologists think they know. They have a pretty good idea. But there is still 
little pieces that they haven't pieced together. Right, right. Now let's get to home sources, and these are the sources uh, that we're going to show you right now, and these are the sources that I discovered at the Jefferson Historical Society Museum in Jefferson, Morris County, New Jersey, where my fine young guest Brian Schnell is the assistant director. Uh, we'll go over these right now. I know you have them right yes, here. Yes, I do. Now, the first home source, and this is a, a wonderful one, a morning card. And you might find these in a shoebox in your own home, but we're going to show you some wonderful examples. What is a morning card? The morning card essentially is the ancestor to what you would normally pick up at a funeral now. Gen sometimes it would have the person's photo on it, their birth and death, mm -hmm. and a little prayer that you can pray for them. It's like a souvenir. Yes, exactly. Okay. It's, or it's a memorial card? Yes, a memorial card. Right, or obituary card. Yes. Okay. So Essentially, it, what you're supposed to do is yeah. take that, mm -hmm. keep it in a cabinet specially set up right. for this, right. and reflect on it and pray on it regularly or put it in the pages of a bible the family yes. bible okay yes. now which is this one you have the one the one that i have in my hand is actually the one for abraham lincoln abe lincoln okay specifically the one that was given to the general public at right. his funeral train stops mm -hmm. now the original one is priceless i'm sure that this is just a copy they we do, yes we were able to acquire a printed copy of it mm -hmm. however the originals they are available, but they are exorbitantly priced. I'm sure. I'm sure. All right. So that was the morning card. Now, what is a? Then we have an example of a funeral announcement, yes. uh, and these were really put on uh, uh, um, what they call cabinet cards. We have we have one here for a lady, and then we have two more there, I believe. Yes. Yes. The the first two that we have here, they are really the more traditional of the styles. Mm -hmm. It would basically, there's a lot of religious iconography on right, them, right. their name, their birth, of, birth and death, and you can yes. see a, the example of a prayer that you can pray for them. Right, right. The, and well, is there a photo of the deceased on not there? No. On no. these. No. You would typically only see that if the person was extremely wealthy. Right. Because photography was expensive. Yes. And this will just announce uh, the person's name? Yes, the name, the birth and death. Funeral announcement. Yes. Okay, and these were, where were these obtainable for the mourners? They were typically obtainable through the mail the, uh, for families who'd send them out. Oh, I see. But you see. could also get them at the services They themselves. would mail them to people yes. or, or you get them Immediate right? family would receive them in the mail and other not immediate family could receive them at the actual funeral services. And these are cabinet cards, right? Yes. Okay. And then you had one for a lady here. Yes, and this from is... our Historical Society collection for a lady by the name of Hildegard Winterbottom. And when did she, when did Hildegard pass on? She passed on in 1984. Oh, all right. And so Relatively that, recently. But... Yeah, so this is just a, an example this is really a funeral announcement, this right here, or would it be a, a, a this memorial would be the, card? A memorial card for her. We know that the Winter, Winterbottom family were sticklers for tradition. Right. So she would, have had her, she would have had this made very similar to what her parents would have had or what her grandparents would right. have had, right. just yeah. a little more modernized. Right. But now you get the announcements online. You yes. know, you just type in the person's name and you can see the... You uh, can go uh, to obituaries.com right. for things like that. Obituaries? Obituaries.com. Really? They have that also? They yes. do. Okay. Um, now, there's one more there. Um, I have never received one. Uh, these are funeral invitations. Can yes. you explain these yes. to us, They please? would. So these funeral invitations would come in the mail, sometimes with a cabinet card, sometimes without. Mm-hmm. And if you were an immediate family member, you would typically receive these. And it would list when the person died, yeah. their full name. Very often it would list the right. interment and sometimes even the plot number. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. way you could find it at the services. It would list when that's going to be, time and date. and Would it, it be a lo location? It what? would be as well, yes. The cemetery or the funeral home. Right. Or the home itself of the family. The home, right, because this is going way back. Yes. And we have two here. Yes, we have two, and the two that we have here 
are from 1901 and 1905. All right, so that, I guess these people were displayed in their homes. Yes. And it will tell you the time of the funeral. Now, you told me that these were sent to three categories of people. Can you, can you tell us those yes. categories? Depending on what your social standing was, if you were just a regular citizen, it would go to your family and friends. However, if you had a status like that of Abraham Lincoln, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I cite him because we have examples of these. Yes. He had, three di he had the three of them. One would be sent to his immediate family, family? typically with a lock of his hair. Okay, really? Yes, okay. Okay. It, it would be put into a mourning ornament yes. for the and, family. And the second one is? The second one would be sent to, they'd be sent to government officials, distant family. It was less personalized All right. than a, an immediate family one. And the then last the third one? one would be given out to the general public. The public, so it's family, government officials, yes. if the person was famous yes. uh, in government or whatever. And if they weren't, not as immediate family. All right, and then the public. Yes. So this was a major event. The, it was. The, the funeral was a major event. It was. Okay. Well, this has been very interesting, um, a bit morbid, but it's part of life. Death is part of life, and we do use, well, we use birth records, we use marriage records, we use military records, and of course, the ultimate death and burial. So uh, these records will have a lot of information on them. What one doesn't have, as Brian has told us, the other one will have. I want to thank you uh, for coming on my show a second time. Of course. And I want all of you out there, when you find time, to visit Brian at the Jefferson Historical Society Museum in the village of Milton, yes. which is in Jefferson Township. Is that correct? That is correct, Stephen. And there's always a new uh, exhibit going on. Your next one, I know you cannot reveal it. I am not allowed to reveal it You're just not yet. allowed to reveal it, but I did go to the uh, morning one, which I found very austere and very interesting, and I did go to your holiday one, yes. which was quite lovely. It was an old-fashioned Victorian Christmas. Yes. And the next one is going to be displayed uh, in the new year, is that yes. correct? Yes, we haven't decided if it's going to be March or April yet, but mm -hmm. this one is going to run probably for between three and four months. Very good. And you'll be there to, I will be. to interview people and to, to give them a guide, a yes. tour guide. I have to be there, Stephen. They have me writing half of it. That's right. That's yes. right. Well, listen, Brian, thank you so of much course. for coming on Family Historian a second time. And on that note, as I've been saying for nearly 35 years, we are all descendants of ancient civilizations. Genealogy is your key to the history of your family. And so until next time, this is Stephen Conti wishing you all a very happy ancestor hunting. Good night.